tapes on calculus. This deals with calculus. This series deals with calculus three, and uh, we're going to begin in the middle of uh, uh, a subject matter uh, called parametric equations. The idea is this: if you want to describe a curve in a plane or in space, you can uh, describe that curve by saying what the x, y, and y coordinates in the plane, for example, are at a particular time t. Or for a particular value of a parameter, a parameter is another word for a variable, um, for example, uh, s or theta or something of that nature. Uh, perhaps it's easiest to begin by looking at an example. Uh, and perhaps one of the most used examples is that of the cycloid. Um, the cycloid is described as follows. The circle radius r is placed um, with its uh, lowest point at the origin and rolled to the right. What happens when you follow this point right here? And this when this is rolled over to the right. Well, what happens is this goes up to a peak and goes back down to zero. Um, imagine, if you like, the circle has been rolled a particular distance here. And the point now is located over here. Um, at an angle theta. That's, then, what happens here is, now I've drawn this, this in a little bit illusory fashion here, the circle perhaps would not have gone this far um, with the points still here. In fact, the actual curve maybe looks something like this. Right. But let's, let's try and describe the x and y coordinates of this point here in terms of the variable theta, or parameter theta. Um, what we've got here is a triangle. And uh, if, if, if this is a circle of radius r, then this amount that's been ruled out here is the same as this amount over here. That's why I say the picture is a little bit illusory. This is the quantity r times theta. So the consequent of the x direction of the center, the x position of the center is going to be at r times theta. Um, less this amount over here. Well, if this is the angle theta, and this quantity right here is r um, sine of theta. So r times theta minus r sine theta gives the x coordinate of this point right here. The y coordinate right, is r, the, the y coordinate of the center is r. But then we have to come down this distance here. This quantity right here is r cosine theta. This is r, and this is the r as the cos is the cosine of theta. So that quantity is r cosine theta. So we have to take r and subtract r cosine theta to get the y coordinates. So this gives the x coordinate as a function of theta. And the y coordinate is a function of theta. And consequently, what we've done is we've parameterized this curve. It consists of all the points x of theta, y of theta, as theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. If we wanted this to roll on indefinitely here, it would continue to make curves like this, we've got theta go between 0 and infinity. All right. So this is the cycloid. Uh, let's look at a couple of slight variations on that. Suppose that instead of, of this point right here, we wish to follow a different point. And in fact, let's imagine that um, this circle right here right, was uh, on a railroad track and that the actual wheel extended below the track like so, and we wish to follow this point right here. Right? 
um, where this radius here is R, and this radius right here is capital R. Then what's the position of this point? Well, it's x coordinate is going to be given by um, what? The same situation is over here, except now we're following this point right here. The, the x coordinate at the center is going to be r theta. But now we have to subtract off capital R sine theta. So here, little r and capital R are fixed quantities, and this is describing x as a function of theta. The y coordinate is going to be r. Well, the y coordinate of the center is going to be r. Up. Minus, now we have to subtract off capital R cosine theta. Right? And so, while these are equations for the cycloid, here are the equations for this point right here, tracing it around as theta increases. Again, theta between 0 and 2 pi. Now, the, the picture that this is going to make is unlike this one. That's to say, it actually looks like this. Starting at time 0, it actually, the, the, this, actual, this point actually backs up and then moves forward in a motion that looks like this. We wish to follow this point here at a radius r bar. Yes. Then x would be equal to r theta again. r theta is the position of the center minus r bar sine theta. And y would be equals to r minus r bar cosine theta. And this point here is going to make a motion that looks something like this. Um, this actually is not drawn very well here because the, the actual situation, as we will see, is that this is a graphical function, and the function has got a slope here which approaches infinity. That's to say this, this point leaves the origin um, in the direction of the y-axis with a tangent in the direction of the y-axis. So here then are three different parametric equations giving you the position of a point x, y, in this case on the cycloid. In this case, <clears throat> following this point around as this wheel moves forward in this direction, and in this case, following this third point around as the wheel moves forward in that direction. And the various graphs look like this, this, and that. Let's take a look at another example of periodic equations in this type. We want to consider um, a projectile. Assume that the only thing that acts on this projectile is uh, is gravity, and so if you like the acceleration in the y direction uh, at any time t is going to be equal to minus g, where g is the gravitational constant, 32 feet per second per second in the English system, or 9.8 meters per second per second in the, in the uh, uh, metric. All right, so consequently what we have here is that y prime of t is equal to minus g to t plus a constant. Now, this constant is going to be y prime of 0. Because y prime of 0 is going to, when we put 0 in here, we're going to get c. And now, y prime of 0 is this part of the velocity. We can break this velocity up. We'll see this in more detail when we look at, at the subject matter of vectors. This is the this is one component right here, and this 
component is is V sine of the angle theta. Right? So that's we get that y prime is equal to um, minus g of t plus v sine of theta. And so y consequently is equal to minus g t squared over 2 plus v times, this is a constant now, v sine theta. So this is v t sine theta. And this now gets y as a function of t. X is a function of t. Um, there's no acceleration of x. The velocity of x at any times t is this part of this velocity v. That's to say, the velocity at any time t in the x direction is going to be v cos theta times t. That's right, that is v t cos theta. I'm sorry, this is going to be, the velocity is going to be v cos theta. The position at any times t is going to be v t cos theta plus a constant here. In, in fact, when we, we developed y here, we should have had plus a constant. But the constant is zero because the constant consists of the position at time zero. y at zero is going to be zero plus zero plus the constant and the, position, the y position at zero is zero. The x position here at zero is also zero. So this then gives us here and here a parametrization of the position x of t and y of t at any time t. From this, we can, we can solve this equation for t, and we get t is equal to um, x over v cos theta. If we, if we take this t and substitute it back in here for in this equation, we get that y is equal to minus g t squared over 2 plus v t uh, sine theta. And now t was x over v cos and theta. So it's clear then that this indicates that y, since g and v cos and theta and v sine theta and sine theta, cos and theta are all constants, that this indicates that y is um, a quadratic equation of x. It's equal to what? Minus g over 2v cos and theta x squared plus, here the v's cancel when we get tangent theta times x. Right? And this should be 2v squared cos and squared theta. So it's a, y is a constant times x squared um, minus a constant times x squared plus a constant times x, which indicates that the shape is that of a parabola. Right? Perhaps it's well known here that the shape of a projectile where there's no wind resistance follows the curve of a parabola. Um, One can determine when this hits the ground by setting up here, setting up uh, y equal to zero and solving for t. Setting y equal to zero here and solving for t will we'll tell you when this hits the ground. There will actually be two solutions to that. What do we have? We have that g t squared over two is equals to v t sine theta. We can divide this by t if t is not equal to zero. t equals zero is one position when y is zero. But, but otherwise, um, if, we, if t is not equal to zero, when we divide
divide this by t, we get that t is equal to um, b sine theta divided by um, g over 2. So 2b sine theta over g is when this hits the ground. Since this is a parabola, and exactly half of that will reach its peak. So you can also compute where the peak of this is and what times t it reaches its peak, in which t is going to be equal to b sine theta over g. If you put that back in here, you can find the y value of namely how high this projectile is going to go by putting t equals b sine theta over g in here for t. So here's a Another example of parametric equations, in this case, a projectile shot at an angle theta with an initial velocity v. Let's take a, some other, take a look at some other examples of parametric equations. Um, let's suppose we've got a function f of x and a point here, say x naught, y naught. And we want to draw the line segments connecting the points to points on the graph and determine the midpoint. Then, um, since this is the, a function f of x, you can always parameterize a function as follows. Let x equals t and y be equal to f of t. Then this gives x and y as a function of t. Now, parameterizations are never unique. So that, for example, another parameterization would be x equals t squared, um, for in particular for t positive, or t cubed, we didn't, or any t here, x equals t cubed, and y equals f of t cubed another parameterization, but this is the simplest perhaps parameterization of the graph of function um, of x. Now, this is the point x naught, y naught, so the midpoint is going to be at the point where x is equal to t plus x naught over 2, and y is equal to f of t plus y naught over 2. f of t plus y naught over to 2. Now, it's interesting to note that we can solve this equation for t, and we get 2x minus x naught is equal to t, so that y is equal to, placing this in here for, for t, y is going to be equal to f of 2x minus x naught plus y naught over to 2. And this indicates that, um, that this parameterization is the parameterization of a curve, which is also a function of x. That's to say, this y here is given in terms of x. And x determines the value of y. You take 2x, subtract x naught, take f of that, add y naught divided by 2, you get a unique value of y. So that all these midpoints here then form a graph of a function. Um, above the x-axis. Let's take a look at another example. Let's suppose that we place a circle here of radius 1. This is one unit. Let's suppose that at 2, we draw the line parallel to the y-axis. We draw all of these, this is a semicircle, of course, here. We draw all of these lines here going through the origin, and we want to know a parameterization of these midpoints. What do these look like? Well, this point right here we can parameterize in polar coordinates, for example. It is um, cosine theta, sine theta. That's to say x is cosine theta and y is sine theta. If this is the point A, well, this isn't in polar coordinates, this 
this is the x-coordinate and that's the y-coordinate, but it's parameterized in terms of theta, you know. And this is the point A of 2 comma A. Then we get A is to sine theta as 2 is to cosine theta. So that A is 2 tangent theta, and so this point right here has for its coordinates 2, um, 2 tangent theta. And so consequently the x coordinate of this midpoint is going to be cosine theta plus 2, 2 plus cosine theta, divided by 2. And the y coordinate is going to be 2 tangent theta plus sine theta divided by 2. So here we have then a parameterization of that curve right, where x is a function of theta and y is a function of theta. Right. So here are two examples then. take a look at another parametric equation. Um, let's look at the uh, parabola y equals x squared. Something like this. And there's one unit. And let's suppose we want to consider the points that are a given distance d away from this parabola. Well, this is perpendicular here to the tangent line. So if we put this distance d on the outside, we'd expect to get something that looks like this. All right. Well, a parameterization of the parabola is going to be the simplest one, perhaps, is x equals t and y equals t squared. So that this right here is a point t, t squared on the parabola. Now let's let our point that we're interested in be x, y. We want to find x as a function of t and y as a function of t. Now, the slope of the tangent line at this point here is going to be 2 to t. Yeah? So, consequently, the slope of this perpendicular here, this is going to be 2 to t, the slope of the perpendicular is going to be minus 1 over 2 to t. Right. So if we compute the slope using this point here and the point t, t squared, we're going to get that y minus t squared over x minus t is equal to minus 1. factored out, and we end up with the 
minus 1 squared is going to be the same as 1 squared. So we end up with 1 over 2t. Um, squared plus 1, this is equal to d squared. Or d squared divided by 1 over 4t squared plus 1. is equal to x minus t squared. So that x minus t is going to be equal to the square root of this, or x is going to be equal to t plus or minus that square root. We have to consider plus or minus the square root. Now, in the case that the distance d was outside of the parabola, and this is going to be the plus part of the square root, because the x coordinate here, at least on the right, is going to be larger than t. Right. For the y coordinate, um, we can replace, we can either replace this in here for x and solve for y, in which case perhaps that's easiest, or even replacing it in, in here, x minus t, right? Um, x minus t is equal to the square root, so x minus t squared is going to be d squared over 1 over 4t squared plus 1. Subtracting that from both sides, we're going to get d squared minus, and again, now this is plus or minus, in this case minus or plus, um, x minus t squared all right, let's say d squared over 1 over 4 t squared plus 1 right, is equal to x minus t squared squared so we take the square root of this, x, uh, y minus t squared, is equal to this. Or y is equal to t squared plus d squared minus or plus d squared over um, one, 1 over 4 t squared plus 1. Right? So here what we have then. parametric equations for x as a function of t and y as a function of t. It's perhaps interesting to note what happens here if b is on the other side. Right? Something strange happens here. If d is relatively small, you get a curve something like this. If d is relatively large, you get something funny happening here. Something of this order. For large d. distance this side, the inside of the parabola. Okay, at any rate, here's another example of parametric equations and how to solve for x and y as functions of t when you're given a curve described in the plane. Sometimes complicated, and this perhaps is, these are perhaps a couple of examples of that. Um, let's take a look and imagine that we've got a circle here, a large circle of radius a, and that we wish to rotate a smaller circle of radius b inside of here with its initial position here. And let's imagine that. At a later time, that circle is located up here. We wish to follow this point. Right? This point is going to go around here and make um, form a curve. And if we wish to follow that point, this is the angle theta. Right? This point is perhaps over here, where this angle is phi. right here is given by 
E times theta. And so that is also this distance right here. Right? If we look at this smaller circle up here, um, this angle right here is the angle theta. The entire angle is the angle phi. And so that this right here is B phi. Um, this right here is B phi. So that's this angle right in here what? This, this angle right in here um, which is B minus theta Uh, is going to be this length right here, which is to say, th this, le this length right here is going to be um, a theta minus b theta, this length right here being b theta, right. that's going to be equal to b phi. So phi that's going to be equal to B times phi. Well, phi, uh, phi minus theta. B times phi minus theta. This angle right in here is phi minus theta. So B times phi minus theta is going to be um, this length right here. So phi minus theta is going to be A theta minus B theta over B. Okay. Now, we want to know the position of this point, x, as a function of theta. We want to know the position of the point, x, y, as a function of theta. We want x as a function of theta, and we want y as a function of theta. Okay? If q is the midpoint here of this um, circle, then q has coordinates B cosine theta, that's its x coordinate, and its y coordinate is A minus B sine theta. So this is, these are the coordinates of this point Q, which is at the midpoint. Right? We want the x coordinate at this point here, so if we go from the midpoint over to there, what we should do for the x coordinate is we go to A minus B. Cosine theta, and we wish to add this x coordinate over here. Well, this angle right here is phi minus theta, right? It's given by this, and what we wish for the x coordinate is this part right here. That's to say sine of this angle. So we want to, to um, add on sine this angle, a theta minus b theta over b. And this then will give us the x coordinates of the point that's gotten when you roll the small circle around inside the large one. The y coordinate, again, if we start at the y coordinate of the center, this is a minus b sine theta. Right? And now what we wish to do is we wish to go, ah, for the x coordinate, we wish to go the cosine of this, cosine of this angle right here. And for the y coordinate, we wish to subtract off the sine of the angle, sine of a theta minus b theta over b. And so this then is the y coordinate of this point as a function of theta. A and B are, of course, fixed here, A being the large radius and B the smaller radius. Okay. So this, then, is an example of a parametrization, namely the parametrization of the point on this circle that, you, that follows this, that when the circle is rotated around inside the 
larger circle. Now, the actual graph of this may look something like this, and so forth. All right, let's take a look at another. Um, let's suppose that we've got a circle here again of radius r. And we'll, let's make this vertical here. And let's suppose that this is wound with string. We want to follow the curve of the string as it unwinds. As to say, as this as the string unwinds here, it's going to spiral outward. And we want to know what this what a point x y on the string. Um, what points x y belong to the string? Well, let's imagine that we've we've unwound this. Um, like so, to an angle theta, then the string is going to be in this position right here. That's to say, it's, it's wrapped around here like this, we've unwound it, and now it's extending out in this direction here. So it's going to extend outward in a, in a right angle, and this point will be a point x, y here. If this is the angle theta, and this is r, then this length right here is r times theta, as is the length of the unwound string equal to r times theta. This length is r times theta, and that length is r times theta. All right. But this is the angle theta, then. OK. Um, the slope of this line is going to be tangent theta. First, the slope of this line is going to be one over minus one over tangent theta, or minus cotangent theta. This point right here is going to be um, r cosine theta, r sine theta, at this point right here. And so we can compute this slope using x, y, and the coordinates of this point, and we get that y minus r sine theta over x minus r cosine theta is supposed to be equal to minus cotangent of theta. We also know the distance between these two points is r theta. That's to say x minus r cosine theta quantity squared plus my minus r sine theta quantity squared is equal to r theta. We can now take these two equations and solve them for x and y. What have we got here? Um, y example from here, minus r sine theta is equal to minus cotangent theta times x minus r theta. Well, x minus r theta, we can write, we can get from here, it's going to be r theta minus um, r sine theta is equal to this, and x minus r cosine theta here is going to be y minus r sine theta squared it's easier to substitute this into here. That's to say we get y minus r sine theta is equal to this times this. And substituting that's this in here, we get um, 
x minus r cos theta squared plus, that's times 1, one of them, plus cotangent squared theta times x minus r cos theta squared is equal to r theta. So we get this times this is r theta, and now we can solve this for x. x is going to be equal to r theta over 1 plus cotangent squared theta, right? square root. That, that'll give us x minus r cos theta. So if we add r cos theta here, we will then have x. Right? Similar considerations will allow you to solve this for y and get x and y as functions of theta. The thing to note here is, is that when we took the square root, this should be plus or minus. In this case, an easy check will determine which one it is. And the, the plus is the correct one here for x. As to say, the x coordinate, as it starts out, is larger than r cos and theta. Okay? The y coordinate will have a plus or minus sign in it also, which can be easily computed to determine which one it is and checked for various angles. Anyway, here's the x coordinate as a function of theta. Uh, similarly, solving this for y, solving these two for y, will give you the y coordinate as a function of theta. Okay, so, two rather complicated parametric equations, in this case here, rotating a circle inside of another circle, here, unwinding a thread and following where the end point of the thread is with respect to a coordinate system. calculus involving um, parametric equations, you want to be able to find the derivative dy dx of a, of, of a um, curve, the slope of the tangent to the curve, when the curve is given parametrically. So that, for example, if x is given by x of t and y is y of t, then we want to know um, what the slope is at a point x of t, y of t. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the cycloid again and use it as an example. This looks something like this, perhaps. And this is the point x of t, y of t. Right. Um, here, where the x coordinate is given by r times t minus r sine t, and the y coordinate is given by um, r minus r cosine t, t here in this case between 0 and 2 pi. Now, to compute dy dx, we use nothing more than the chain rule. So dy dx is dy dt, well, this is the derivative of y with respect to t, at t over dx dt. So that in particular here, if this is x and y, then dy dx, or the cycloid, is going to be given by the derivative of y with respect to t, which is to say um, minus r is fixed here, r. Derivative of cosine t is minus the sine of t, so plus r sine t. That's dy dt, that belongs in the numerator. The x dt is r, derivative of t is 1 with respect to t, minus r, derivative of sine t is cosine t. Now, I mentioned earlier here that uh, this is a bad drawing. That this really leaves the origin in perpendicular fashion. And we can 
see that by taking this right here, which is which is equal to sine t over 1 minus cosine t, looking at the limit as t approaches 0 of sine t over 1 minus cosine t. Now, the numerator approaches 0 and the denominator approaches 0 here, so look, Tau's rule applies. This is going to be equal to the limit if it exists as t approaches 0. Derivative of the sine is, is the cosine. In the denominator here, we get 1 minus the derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, so we get the sine. And now the numerator approaches 1, the denominator approaches 0. We're looking at the limit from the right, actually, here, so this is going to be plus infinity. So this indicates that this cycloid here actually has a slope, which is very large as t goes to 0 from the right, and that's this tangent is the y-axis. Okay. Um, it's perhaps worthwhile noting here also that um, y is a function of x here. It's not easy to find y as a function of x, but for the cycloid here, y is some function f of x. Uh, not only that, if you notice that as t goes between 0 and pi, this is the position at pi, this is the position at 0, um, sine t increases. Right? This, the derivative of this function actually is greater than 0, and so that this is an increasing function between, zero, between t equals 0 and t equals pi. Um, this is not the t-axis, this is the x-axis, but at um, t equals pi, the point on the curve is right here, and then this function has got a positive, the dy dx here is positive. Um, another way to see that this is a function of x is, is to do the following. Let's t between, be between 0 and 2 pi. Let's, let's let t be between 0 and pi. And let's suppose that the y values, um, the x value, the, the, there are two y values for a given x value. So if we let x be given here, and we look at what y is, let's suppose that, that for a particular value of t, we have r minus r cosine t, um, is equal to r minus r cosine, let's say, capital T. Then what we get here is just subtracting r from both sides and dividing by r, we get cosine little t is equal to cosine capital T. And if these are values for t and capital T between 0 and and pi, cosine t equals to cosine capital T, says that t is equal to capital T. So that's for two y values here that are equal, like so, if the y value at little t is the same as the y value at capital T, then little t is the same as capital T. And that says that there's exactly one x value that has a particular y value and we're actually dealing with a curve whose graph is a function, in this case of t, but a function that's not easy to get at. Here's its parameterization, though. I want to take a look now at the formula for arc length for a curve which is parameterized. So let's imagine that we've got a curve here given by the points x of t, y of t, right? where t takes on its values between a and b. And the, the way to get the parameterization of this curve all right, is to partition the interval between a and b. And imagine that this is ti minus 1 and this is ti. And then this corresponds to the point, let's say, x of ti, y of ti, and this to the point, x of ti minus 1, 
y of ti minus 1. And then we're going to approximate the length along here by following these straight line segments and adding up their lengths and taking the limit as the one of the partition goes to zero. So that's to say this length here is going to be equal to, well, first of all, it's going to be approximately equal to, if we take x of ti minus x of ti minus 1 squared plus y of ti minus y of ti minus 1 squared, take the square root of that, that's going to be the length of this little segment right here. Right? If we want the length, the sum of the lengths of all the segments, we take the sum i goes from 1 through n here across the partition. And if we want this to become more and more exact, we can let the partition get smaller. And in the limit here, as the number of the partition goes to 0, we should have the length. Now, we'd like this to look like summation f of wy delta xi, or f of wy delta ti, and the limit, because then this would correspond to an integral. We don't have this at present. Let's see what we can do with this. If we um, take this and divide numerator and denominator, or divide this by ti minus ti minus 1, and then multiply by ti minus ti minus 1, we get this, this is the limit. As the number of the partition approaches 0, the sum, I learned from 1 through n, square root x of ti minus x of ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1 quantity squared plus y of ti minus y of ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1 quantity squared and now we divide it by ti minus ti minus 1 here we need to multiply by it and that's to say we need to multiply outside here by ti minus ti minus, I minus 1, or delta ti. We're almost there. We're, we almost have this looking like some function of wi times delta xi, or delta ti in this case. Using the mean value theorem, we get this is the limit as the number of the partition goes to 0 of the sum. i goes from 1 through m. Using the mean value theorem, we can find a point wi so this is equal to x prime at wy. x of ti minus x of ti minus 1 over ti minus ti minus 1 will be x prime of wy. So this will be its squared. We can also find uh, a point ui. So this will be y prime at ui. And so this will be its squared. So we've got this plus this squared delta ti. Now, if x and y are, are continuous, if this partition is small, um, we can replace the wy here with the ui, or vice versa, and we will still have approximately the same amount. In particular, we'll have the same amount in the limit. And so then this will correspond to something that looks like this, and consequently to the integral from a to b of the square root x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared b of t. And this consequently is the formula for the arc length. Now, we want to also get a formula here for the situation where x and y are given in terms of theta and polar coordinates. That's to say, if x is equal to r of theta cos of theta, and y is equal to r of theta sine theta, then x prime of theta is going to be, this is a product, it's going to be the first, and I'll just write r of theta as r now, times the derivative of the second, derivative of the second, the cosine is, is uh, minus the sine, I'm going to abbreviate sine by s, so it's going to be minus rs plus the second cosine theta times the derivative of the first, so r prime C. So the derivative of x of theta is 
minus r sine theta plus r prime cosine theta. The derivative of y is in the same notation here. It is going to be r, the derivative of sine is cosine, um, plus the sine times the derivative of r. So r prime s. r of theta cosine theta plus r prime of theta sine theta. Now, what I want to do is I want to put these into here. Right? And instead of th t as a, as a parameter here, now we've got theta. So that this says that the length is going to be equal to the integral. We're going to go here between the first angle, theta 1, and the second one, theta 2.
Let's suppose we want to know this length right here. That's the state between 0 and i over 2. So this is r of theta. Our prime of theta is going to be equal to um, 1 third of e to the theta over 3. And now the formula says that what we should do is we take the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the square root, the function squared, that's to say e to the theta over 3 squared, or e to the 2 theta over 3, plus um, this squared, which is going to be 1 ninth e to the 2 theta over 3. So all together here, we're going to get 10 ninths for the square root of 10 ninths. The square root of e to the 2 theta over 3 is going to be e to the theta over 3. We want the integral of this from 0 to pi over 2 with respect to theta. So here's r squared plus r prime squared. Huh? Square root integrate with respect to theta. Now this is simple, see? Normally if you do this, take r squared and r prime squared and take the square root. It doesn't necessarily turn out to be nice at all. But for this particular example, we get the square, square root of 10 over 3. And under e to the theta over 3 is going to be e to the theta over 3. Not quite. We're going to have to divide by a third. Huh? And differentiate this, we're going to be a third e to the theta over 3. When we evaluate that from 0 to pi over 2, the third and the 3 cancel here. So this leaves us with the square root of 10. Um, and e to the pi over 6, when we put theta equals pi over 2 in here, minus the value of 0, which is going to be e to the 0 over 1. So that's the arc length of that curve between 0 and pi over 2. Let's look at the side point. Let's compute this arc length. It turns out that this, this works out very nicely. Um, what do we have here? We've got x equals, I'm going to write this in terms of t instead of theta here because it really is a, is a, is a um, parameter, t so to speak. rt minus r sine t, that's the x coordinate. The y coordinate is t is equal to r minus r cosine t. So those are the points x, y on this curve. And now we want to compute x prime. It's going to be equal to r um, minus r cosine t. y prime of t is going to be equal to r sine t. And so now the integral that we're interested in here, this is for t between 0 and 2 pi. This is. So we want to integrate from 0 to 2 pi. All right. And we get x prime squared, which is r squared minus 2r squared, well, r squared cosine t plus r squared cosine squared t, that's x prime squared, plus y prime squared is going to be r squared sine squared t. Take the square root of this and integrate it with respect to t. What have we got here? We've got r squared cosine squared t plus r squared sine squared t, so that's going to be equal to 1, or 1 r squared, that is. So altogether we get r integral from 0 to 2 pi. What do we have left? We've got 1 r squared and another r squared, so we're going to get 2 r squared here. So we're going to have 2 r squared and another 2 here, so we can write this as square root of 2, square root of r squared minus r squared cosine t. Well, that actually, the r squared's been taken out of here, so this is going to be 1 minus cosine t dt. Okay, now look at the 
go to this point here like as if this is impossible. And in a lot of cases, it's very difficult to, to compute the integral when you take x prime squared and y prime squared, add them together, and take the square root. However, 1 minus cosine t as, can be rewritten as 2 sine of sine squared of t over 2. That's from the, from the well-known formula here that's, that sine squared of t is equal to um, 1 minus cosine 2 to t divided by 2. So that 1 minus cosine t is going to be 2 sine squared of t over 2. So this is equal to 1 minus cosine t. Right. Now what we do here is when we put the, replace this with 1 minus cosine t, we get the square root of it, which is going to be another square root of 2 times the sine of t. So this is going to be equal to recopying the r here, integral from 0 to 2 pi, 2, bring 2 out, we've got square root of 2 here from this and square root of this, so we have sine of t over 2, dt. Now an antiderivative of sine of t over 2 is going to be minus cosine of t over 2, Um, divided by a half. So minus 2 cosine t over 2. We want to evaluate this from 0 to 2 pi. We get this integral. And uh, what? The value of at 2 pi, we're going to be looking at cosine of pi. is going to be minus 1. Cosine of pi is going to be minus 1, so we're going to get plus 2. And the cosine of 0 is 1, so we're going to get this minus and minus 2, or 4. So all together here we get 4 times 2r, or 8r, is the length. can also be um, used to compute areas and volumes. Let's look at the cycloid again. Like so. Here this is given by x is equal to um, r theta minus r sine theta and y is given by r minus r cosine theta. We wanted to know the area inside here. If we knew that this was a function of x, and in this case we do know that it's a function of x, we would write that the area was equal to the integral of y dx, where y was the function of x. Now, if we make the substitution in here, where we let y be equal to this and x be equal to this, we will then be able to actually compute the area. And the substitution is justified. Right? We're simply making a change of variables. We're assuming y is a function of x and making the substitution here. This originally went from a to b. In this case, a and b are these two points here, 0 and 2 pi, are, um, well, actually, theta is 2 pi. a equals 0 and b is 2 pi r. We're now going to go, when a is 0, um, theta is 0. 2 theta is equal to 2 pi. Right. So we want to compute this area here. It's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi. y is r minus 
minus r cos and theta. Dx, well, if x is r theta, um, minus r sine theta, x prime is going to be, uh, this is x is a function, derivative of x with respect to theta is going to be r minus r cosine theta. So dx will be given by x prime d theta, or dx d theta d theta. So for dx here we then get r minus r cosine theta d theta. And now the substitution where y is equal to r minus r cosine theta and x is equal to r theta minus r sine theta has been completed here, and now we've got this integral that computes. Well, what happens here? When we multiply this out, we're going to get r squared throughout here, so let's bring r squared out of the picture here. 0 to 2 pi. We've got 1 minus cosine theta times a 1 minus cosine theta here, right? Okay. 1 minus cosine theta for the y, 1 minus cosine theta here, so we get 1 minus 2 cosine theta plus cosine squared theta, d theta. And now, to do this, we want to use the substitution cosine squared theta is 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. So we get 1 minus 2 cosine theta plus this d theta, integral from 0 to 2 pi and times r squared. Okay, and then I drew it here then is going to be theta minus 2, and I with cosine theta is going to be sine theta. Right? Now we've got a half, and I a half is going to be half theta, so we've got theta already, so let's make this 3 halves theta. We've got r squared outside here. And now, and then I do it with cosine 2 theta over 2, and I do it with cosine 2 theta is going to be sine 2 theta over 2. So all together here, we're going to get sine 2 theta over 4. We want to evaluate this from 0 to 2 pi. Right. So this is going to be equal to r squared. Um, the value at 0 is 0 throughout here. 0, 0, and 0. Huh? So all we need to do is evaluate this to 2 pi. And so we get times 3 halves times 2 pi. Um, sine of 2 pi is 0. Huh? So we get 0 here, and sine of 4 pi is 0. So we get 0 here. So all together we get 3 pi r squared for that area. Now, if instead, if we wanted to take this cycloid and revolve it, let's say, about the x-axis and compute the res resulting volume, the volume would be given by the integral of pi y squared dx from a to b, which in this case is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi. We replace the y with this substitution, r minus r cosine theta, that squared. Um, times dx. dx is going to be r minus r cosine theta d theta. Okay? So we get this integral giving us the volume of the solid revolution. If instead we wish to take this and revolve it about the y-axis producing something that looked like this, So, then the formula for the volume would be, you know, go from A to B, 2 pi y, dx. 2 pi y, right. Here's a typical little piece here. It's got height y, 2 pi x y dx. 2 pi.
pi x is the circumference here. The height of this little piece is y. The thickness is dx. So this is the formula here for, for the volume of, of the solid revolved about the y-axis. And so that this is going to be equal to 2. I'm going to make this change of variable. The integral from 0 to 2 pi. We've got 2 pi. x was r theta minus r sine theta. y is r minus r cosine theta. Integrate this d theta, and it will give us that volume. So that's but with using parametric equations, you can take your usual formulas for, for areas and volumes, and for that matter, as we've already seen, arc length. And um, you can also use these for surface area, and you can compute the areas and volumes by making this the substitution here. Um, y of t for y, and x of t for x. Where you have, if you've got dx, it's, the substitution is um, x times t dt. So there's some examples. We want to talk a bit now about vectors in the plane. Eventually we're going to take this, the vectors and we're going to use them to represent this three-dimensional space. A vector um, is something which has a magnitude or a numerical value, so to speak. Right. Direction. Right. And, and these add, so what vectors have here, if you want, magnitude, direction, and add what's called the parallelogram rule. So there's a rough description of vectors, and we'll generally represent vectors by arrows. And the length represents the magnitude. vector and the vector is so many pounds, then we would represent one pound by a fixed length, a unit length, and the length of the vector would represent the pounds. The direction of the vector represents the direction. Two vectors that have the same magnitude and direction are equal. So this is the vector u, this is also the vector u. And now to write vectors, um, it's easiest to put a little arrow over the letter. In, in typing, this is usually the vector is usually indicated by a very bold letter, but that's not easy to do if you're simply writing. So a small arrow over the letter um, will represent a vector. All right. So that these two are the same vectors if they've got the same magnitude in the same direction. Now, what's meant by the parallelogram rule? Well, if we've got two vectors, u and v, well, let's not make that horizontal. Let's look like this. To add u to v, what we do is complete this parallelogram. And the resulting vector that goes from one corner to the other is the vector u plus v. You can also draw this picture like this. Here's v. Here's u. And consequently, when you add u and v together, you get the vector u plus v. There's the parallelogram. But, um, one thing the vector can represent is displacement. If you walk in this direction here, this distance, and this direction v, and you follow that by walking in the direction u, you end up over here, which is this displacement u plus v. And clearly, if we go u first and then v, we end up in the same place. So displacement. one quantity, which is a vector, position. Same concept, essentially, as displacement. But the position of something can be indicated by means of a vector. 
also velocities, acceleration, force, torque, returning power, spin. These are all quantities which can be represented by means of vectors, each having their own particular units. If we look in the plane, we usually identify a vector u with the vector the representation of it that starts at the origin. And so this is the vector u, and it ends at a, b. We represent u by the point a, b. And the vector v, then, if it ends at c, b, this can be a vector v here, we represent it by the pair of numbers c, d. And then what the parallelogram rule says is the following. And if we add these two together, the x-coordinate of u plus v is going to be a plus c. And the y-coordinate of u plus v is going to be c, v plus d. So that the, the addition, by means of the parallelogram rule, can be affected if vectors are represented as points in the plane by adding the x-coordinates and adding the y-coordinates. So this then would be the vector um, u plus v. Okay, so this is some introductory ideas involving vectors. There's more to come. Um, there's plenty of things that you can do with vectors as, as will become very apparent. some things that can be done with vectors in the plane still now. We've got vectors u and v. I've already noted that you add these by means of the parallelogram rule. So this vector right here is the vector u plus v. Um, we also want to be able to multiply a vector by a constant. And we want several representations for these vectors. If this vector u ends at the point a, b, then recall that we represent this as a, b. And if v ends at c, b, then we represent this vector v as the point c, d, or the pair c, d. Um, it's traditional in the, to take a unit vector in the x direction and designate it by i. i is going to be the vector it's one unit long here. It's going to be the vector 1, 0. And j in the y direction. So j is going to be equals to 0, 1. It starts at the origin and goes up to 0, 1. Right? And in that case, we can rewrite u here. And sometimes it's more convenient to do this as ai plus bj. Similarly, v is ci plus dj. We also want to be able to take u and multiply it by a constant. So we want to be able to talk about a constant times u. And this, if u is a, b, this is going to be the vector that is um, k, a, k, b. Right? If we multiply um, a, b by, by a constant k here, we're going to end up with with this, with a vector in the same direction, um, and the magnitude of this vector is going to, the, is, which is proportionate to its length here, that's to say it's represented by its length, is going to be k times the magnitude of u. The magnitude of u is written like this. Sometimes you can use a double line if you want to guarantee that you're dealing with magnitude rather than absolute values. It's equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. And so consequently, we've got that the magnitude of KU is equal to um, the square root K squared A squared plus K squared B squared. That's to say, it's equal to absolute K times the magnitude of U. Magnitude of U is square root A squared plus B squared. We also
also want k to be allowed to be negative. So that, for example, this vector right here is going to be the vector minus u, which is minus 1u. And still, the magnitude of k times u, whether k is positive or negative, will be the absolute value of k times the magnitude of u. That's so going to be the length here, which represents the magnitude of the quantity. We, given that we've got minus u here now, we also want to be able to subtract two vectors. So if we've got v, for example, minus u, right, this is going to be equal to the vector v plus the vector minus 1 times u. Right? And naturally enough, it's going to be equal to here, c minus a, um, d minus b. Indeed, the vector v minus u is the vector that you add to u to get v. So you can represent it up here like this. This is the vector v minus u. You add it by means of the parallelogram rules to u, and you get to v. Um, we also want something which is called the dot product. This is given very simply. Um, if u is equal to a, b, and we want to take the dot product of that with v, c, d, dot product is defined to be a times c plus b times d. So then you take the x coordinates and you multiply them and add that to the y coordinates multiplied. Okay. Um, consequently, the magnitude of u is going to be the square root of u dotted with u. It's another way to write the magnitude of u. If you take u dotted with u, it's going to be a squared plus b squared. Take the square root of that, we get the magnitude. So here we can write the magnitude using this dot product, and we don't have to know what the coordinates of the vector are. Um, that product satisfies several rules here. For one thing, u dotted with v is uh, the same as v dotted with u. Right? Note that the dot product is a real number. Right? When you deal with numbers in a vector situation, numbers are sometimes called scalars. That's to say they provide a scale. Right? Or quantities which which results from in numbers are sometimes called scalars here. So you can talk about multiplying a scalar times a vector. For example, here, k is the scalar, k times u. This is the scalar times the vector here. This is multiplication of a vector by a number. Here, this, is, however, is the dot product, and it results from taking two vectors, you end up with a scalar or a number. At any rate, it satisfies these rules here. U dotted with V is the same as V dotted with U. That's easy to see. U dotted with V plus W. Well, this is vector addition here, adding the two vectors and then taking the dot product. You get the same thing as if you took U and dotted with V and added U dotted with W. That's really easy to check. And uh, because this commits here, the dot product distributes across the sum uh, from the other side also. But u dotted with u, well, that's the, u dotted with kv is the same as k times u dotted with v. And it's the same as ku with me. Again, easily checked. Um, by means of putting a particular vector u equal to ab and bcd here, and looking what happens when you compute this or this or this. You know, this is by this is meant take the vector k u and dot it with v. Here k v and dot it with u. Um, the 
zero value at any vector u. So this is the zero vector. It's going to be equals to zero. The zero vector is what included in this system here. The zero vector here is corresponds to the point zero, zero. It's kind of an anomaly. It's got um, magnitude zero and any direction that you would want. And if you take zero and dot it with, that, with a vector, you get the number zero back. So here are some things that can be done with vectors and the dot product and its properties. says this. And in a triangle with sides A, B, and C, um, that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine of the angle C, where the angle C is the one opposite the side C. Now, there are actually five pictures that you need to consider to show that the law of cosines holds. One of them looks like this. This is A, this is B, this is C, this is the angle C here. Right? This, this, is, this is the case where, where this perpendicular lies outside of, of the segment A. The second possibility is that it lies exactly on corner, so this is A, and this is B, and this is C. In this case, this angle C is 90 degrees, and the cosine of C is zero, and this is exactly the Pythagorean theorem. So in this case here, we, we can see that the, the law of cosines holds. Um, a third possibility is like this, where this is A, and this is B, and this projected downward lies in between the two. Here's the angle C. A fourth is that it looks like this, where this is A, and this is B, and this is C. This is the angle C. This is not the Pythagorean theorem. It has to be done separately. The fifth possibility is looks like so, where this is A, this is B, and this is C, and this down here is the angle capital C. Yeah? But to show that this holds, this is the case, of course, where the, this lies outside and to the left of the triangle. Um, to show that it holds, what we really need to do with all five of these cases is show that this always happens here. Let's take a look at just one of them. Actually, the Pythagorean theorem is one of them. Let's take a look at this one right here and see that the law of cosines holds. Right? Um, what do we have here? If we call this this let's say D, and this H. Then from this right triangle right here, we have that C squared by the Pythagorean theorem is equal to the H squared plus A plus D squared. That's this right triangle right here. From this right triangle right here, we have that B squared is equal to um, D squared plus H squared. Right? So that here we've got c squared is equal to h squared plus a squared plus b squared plus 2ad. Right? I'm going to replace h squared here by b squared minus d squared. h squared here is going to be replaced by h squared from this is equal to b squared minus d squared. I replace this here, then I get c squared is equal to a squared plus 2ad um, plus b squared. b squared minus d squared, so plus 2ad. Right. Now, what I want here is that c squared is a squared plus b squared minus 2ab uh, cos of c. So, 
let's take a look at the situation here. Um, B is to D is the cosine of this angle. D is to B is the cosine of this angle right here. So this is minus the cosine of C. Cosine of C is going to be negative. So cosine of so we get that D is equal to minus B cosine C. And this completes the picture. C squared is now equal to A squared plus B squared plus 2A. D is minus B cosine C. So we get minus 2AB cosine C. Now that's the proof of the law of cosines for this picture right here. To do it completely, you need to check these other three pictures, which is perhaps a good exercise. Right? Adding this though, now we're going to get the significance for the, for the dot products. Um, let's suppose that we've got two vectors, A and B. And we can represent A by the magnitude of A and um, B by the magnitude, the magnitude of B by B. Right? In that case, this vector right here is the vector B minus A. angle here theta. If, if, the, if the magnitude of this is C, then um, this angle would be would be the angle corresponding to C here in the law of cosines. We now want to take a look at B minus A dotted with B minus A. That's to say, this is the magnitude of, of B minus A squared or C squared. This is C squared. If, if I do this dot product here, now using the distributive property, I'm going to get that this is equal to B dotted with B by plus minus 2 A dotted with B plus A dotted with A. Considerations now involved in vectors. We've got two vectors, u and v. Uh, v. Right. Um, we have the dot product of u and v. It gives us the magnitude of u 
times the magnitude of V times the cosine.